You know, you gotta be some kind of stupid to condense 50 hours of JRPGs into a single video. Welcome to my show. Writing about Chrono Trigger is an impossible task. It's a distillation of so many efforts, hopes, dreams, the culmination of a convergence of titans. How do you write about something that so many people share deeply personal experiences with? Well, you hope it's good, else it's curtains for you. I think the more interesting discussion lies with Cross and its connections to Trigger, in how design philosophy in a sequel can depart so wildly from its predecessor, how the integrity of the original and its major elements can be retained while cast in another light, viewed through another lens. And of course, watching a story tearing itself apart like a cheap grocery bag. This is Chrono Trigger slash Chrono Cross, a comparative analysis. In case you somehow don't know, Chrono Trigger is the story of a kid who meets a girl at the fair. She gets thrown back in time because Chrono's friend did a stupid, and the quest to retrieve her and find a way home is overtaken by the broader plot to vanquish the Earth's greatest threat. Quick anecdote, it took me until 2021 to play Chrono Trigger. I know. Because I thought Chrono looked... Dumb. No, I don't want to hear it. Everyone knows my taste is impeccable, but Chrono looked like a soup of Toriyama's other hero characters. He didn't feel new or interesting. And that's the worst. When the main character doesn't strike you, it stopped me from playing so many games because that's what they're selling you. In JRPGs, often, that's you. And if it's not jiving, it's not gonna happen, right? But I've eaten enough crow to learn that appearances are almost nothing. You know, the gameplay systems matter most. And if you play long enough in another body, you can learn to like it. And I do want to talk about Toriyama for a bit, but before that, let's acknowledge that Chrono Trigger is a few important things. It's one of the most successful SNES JRPGs. It's one of the best designed JRPGs, possibly even transcending genre. Possibly one of the best designed games. And it's the result of an unbelievably unlikely collaboration a grueling work schedule, and deep pools of talent. Basically, Chrono Trigger is a dream project that exemplifies the best and worst of game development, a cosmic phenomenon that will not repeat itself. Okay, we're past the part where I have to announce to everyone that I like the game. Now I can be a prick. Chrono Trigger is the result of focus testing a classroom of 10-year-old boys. You got dinosaur. You got medieval fantasy. You got robots. And who could forget? Starvation. This game's been dissected to the individual cell, so let's talk standouts. Three key takeaways stuck with me post-playthrough. The first is obvious effort. It's an incredible thing to go back to a game that's a quarter of a century old and immediately recognize the level of polish on every facet. The exaggerated animations. <laughs> The effects, the gorgeous sprite work, the soundtrack. This experience has lasted through decades because it is absolutely not a waste of your time. The devs are putting on a show, and it's good. Ooh, Tatsumaki Senpukyaku! It feels like no expense was spared, from the mountains of possible endings to the endless novel experiences in the main plot. It's a game that's constantly reinventing itself around its core gameplay elements. You engage with it in ways totally atypical of a JRPG, which is the real triumph here, and that's the second takeaway. The design is razor sharp, and yeah, concession time, the scripted battles that occasionally pop up are the worst parts of the game, looking at you, disgusting alien freak, but they're a minute part of the playtime. It's an experience that's almost perfectly cropped. From the moment I entered the first area, I knew the designers were committed to ensuring a smooth, enjoyable experience. And I gotta tell you, it's the kind of thing that almost brings you to tears these days. With piles of throwaway encounters, hours of wasted time, in so many games. In Chrono Trigger, time is of the essence. Enemies stay out of your way unless you want to engage almost all of the time. When you fight, there's no... You get it. The battles take place on this screen. It's the most beautiful thing I've ever seen. Seriously, JRPGs tend to send combat to the combat dimension, distinct from the game itself dimension. So this small thing, and I'm assuming it wasn't easy to implement, changes the entire player relationship with combat. Combat is organically implemented into the world. There is no break, no strain between modes of play. Encounters are few unless you're looking for them, and the need to grind is almost non-existent. It's balanced so finely, always considered. And combat itself is a treat, much more so than many of its peers. Even today, it's not four dudes blowing in and waiting for their turn and slowly doing whatever you picked from the menu to to these static, boring enemies. No. No, in Chrono Trigger, you're on a timer, son. Get on that Korean APM. In Chrono Trigger, dudes are schmoovin'. Look at that walk. 
Look at that roam. Sometimes enemies get thrown by other enemies as weapons. This stuff was groundbreaking. Even today it's exciting and it's totally relevant because most special moves or techs hit specific areas like in a line or a small radius. So current enemy position impacts your decision making in combat. You can optimize your damage by paying attention. Not to mention, enemies are hardly punching bags. Often they hit hard enough to be a significant threat if left alone or they go down quick because they're assisting bigger monsters. Sometimes enemies need to be hit with specific kinds of damage or at specific times like the shield enemies. And none of this is unheard of, but all the elements work in harmony to produce that heightened experience. So I met the one dude with a club, right? And nothing was really working. So I thought, okay, maybe fire and <laughs> his club burnt off? What? This is the stuff I love about video games. Interacting in the interactive medium. This is a sidebar, but I thought it was bizarre for a JRPG with magic to exclude a traditional mage until much later. But it shows that degree of consideration I appreciate. Almost everyone uses magic, some better than others, but only one. The true mage can pull off consistent powerful AoE spells with no external stat boosts. And good, he would have taken away from the strategy, the joy of combat. As it stands, he joins when the player is getting tired really turns combat into a breeze. It's a small thing, but those things stack to the ceiling. So, from combat to scenario, everything is tightened, perfectly pressurized. But perfection alone is synthetic, doesn't endear people, right? The Tetris fandom may exist, but it's pretty quiet. And I think part of that quality design lies in subverting expectations, sometimes at the expense of the player. In short, the game mixes humor and heart into a mixture I'll sloppily call my third takeaway. Toriyama had a hand in this. His art style is more more lighthearted than grim, you can expect that the game cares about comedy. So many scenes are just outright comical. Oh no. What? <laughs> Wait, you can't do that. What? <laughs> so many things outwardly troll the player. Like in the sewers, you get a warning that the dangerous fish people attack if they hear noise. So you step on a save point, get the tinkle, and get ambushed. It's amazing. What is wrong with you, whoever did that? Beautiful work, by the way. Later on, you have to guess which save point is actually a portal to the upstairs, and one of them will just attack you. Like a regular monster. It's hilarious. There's a boss that's a boss earlier on, and the next time you see him, it's like, whoa. Okay, he's not moving. Let's save. Gonna get going here. Uh-oh. Uh-oh! Speaking of troll design, that trial though? You start the fair off by screwing around, eating other people's lunch. I actually waited for the girl to pick candy. And later, when you're set up in a totally farcical trial, after the princess disappears, they pull out all your decisions, shove them in your face. Given, yeah, it's kangaroo court, but it's fascinating to watch. Shoot, just watching how many jurors come out for you is nail-biting. I genuinely thought I'd be innocent, but no. And we find out that Chrono isn't so lawful good as many protagonists tend to be. Now, he'll cut down a a few guards for freedom. His friend even comes to rescue the guy, pushing a man down a flight of stairs, breaking his neck, killing him instantly? So we're evil now, huh? Let's go! This is to say that Chrono Trigger is interesting, makes its party interesting. I mean, when the main character gets toriyama they replace him with the villain, so he's not the real villain. Whatever, it's cool. And the remaining scenarios the party gets into, or more accurately is constantly moving between, are dramatic and interesting by design. It's always unpredictable, partly thanks to the time travel component, and comedy never undercuts the importance of the drama in inappropriate ways. It's an excellent dramedy. If you need another example, the party gets captured, they stage a daring escape, have to fight a boss, never mind he gets airsick, oh snap the real boss is blasting us, no problem, jump 50 feet into the air onto his ship, which is my ship. Give me the ship! This game is amazing. <laughs> and I don't think it's an exemplary story by virtue of its script or scenarios. Rather, I think it's a great game story for managing to make the player care about pixel people, robots, etc. Enough to use every party member for at least some time, for making the side quests a reward instead of a chore, and never being too hard or too verbose to get through. It wants and allows the player to engage with it openly. Originally, I thought the Toriyama-esque design of everything would be a weakness. I mean, really, we've got a Frankenstein of Toriyama main character features, literally just Bulma, the multiple what do young boys like, tropey time periods, time travel, important old men in funny hats, literally just fusion, one of these. 
I mean no disrespect to the guy. He's a legend. My fear was his self-flagellation and immediate emission vomit onto the creative palette would dilute the emergent original aspects of the game. And apparently Toriyama had a less direct impact on the world design than the team in general, but I think the elements I personally find tacky really gel well with the experience. Prehistory, the future, shifting between settings, and picking up party members from those settings, seeing how your actions have impact across time. It's a setting and a set of aesthetics that exist as both playful and important equally, which squares great with the dramedy of Chrono Trigger. And I have to stress it, because the story is told mostly with action, and every action the player takes in some way aids the destruction of Lavos, the final boss, every single thing in the game feels important. It's so rare to find JRPGs where everything can be tied back to the central conflict. But here's your golden goose. If you told me earlier that a giant hard-shelled parasite would make a great villain, I wouldn't have believed you. But when I heard that shriek, I believed. One cry that echoes through history. Chrono Trigger alone does not need another video, but its sequel is something else entirely. It's safe to say Trigger is timeless, but what does Cross say about Trigger and its legacy? It's like this. I know I'd have a way better time for playing Chrono Trigger, but I'd rather go back to Cross. This is a full spoiler discussion. You get exactly one more warning before things get crazy. Now, the first thing to understand is that Chrono Cross, in relation to Trigger, is a heinous <laughs> nightmare game. I love it. It's the perfect cocktail of stunning aesthetic elements, cool innovations, and the most psychotic mishandling of a long-form plot I've ever seen. Ever since Department Heaven dug its claws into my veins and sucked out my soul, because the soul is stored in the veins, obviously, I've really enjoyed complex RPG systems more than I should. And Chrono Cross is full of that. In a phrase, I had fun, but no guarantees. It's almost like Cross was developed with a single line in mind. Everything Trigger isn't. And yeah, occasionally bits of the original's design ethos worm their way in, but most people who touch Cross are left wondering, what? Why? What? What? Let me give you some examples. The story and pacing are unfocused, jumpy, weird, nothing like Trigger. Combat is complex, much more so than before, and while it has its good points, it doesn't capture the magic of the active and emergent encounters of the previous game. Speaking of complexity, there's about 40 characters and no discernible reason for it in relation to what the last game established. I can speculate about wanting to show many lives, flesh out a world, but Trigger became famous for its expediency, for trimming the fat. The tone of the game has shifted away from the lighthearted and dramatic to heartfelt, and very extremely important. Now, it's not to say the game has no humor or levity. Actually, it's full of comedic bits. Oh, a sacred lickaroo from Licky Licky! <laughs> I mean, there's a recurring pair of chimp brains called Salt and Pepper. You know? Even the characters and scenarios they get into are funny at times. You'll fall into a cage trap and somehow taunt the guards into opening the cage to fight you. It's ridiculous. So the notion that the tone shift is too wild or out of line is partially false, but very often the game injects comedy where it's kind of crazy, where things seem like they should be taken seriously, maybe because of the new art direction or it's totally abandoning charm to tell an extremely high concept story near the end. I think the real trouble is the designs and verisimilitude of the world presented don't jive really well with farce, like slapping Crash into Final Fantasy VII. And the game isn't lacking for detail, maybe compared to the original, but they had to ensure that 40 characters spoke in largely unique ways. So some are formal, some are delinquents, and... Ooga Booga! <laughs> Yo, she really talks like a cave person, then drops the me um, wantum thing? Isn't that like an insensitive stereotype of native peoples? Did Cross just conflate natives and cavemen? Well, ooga booga! Uh oh! Oh god, the accent transliterations are amazing. Like, the main girl character does a Cockney accent, and then there's a French girl who totally speaks normal, not awful French. Totally. And the Nordic Scandinavian mermaid. I had no idea that 50% of that language's vowels were dotted with umlauts. <laughs> the key similarity between games is cosmic importance. Both games heavily feature events of cosmic importance. Several characters return from Trigger, it picks up on old threads, but you never know any of that, only playing certain portions of the game. And to me, it feels like a totally inappropriate direction for what it could have been. But let's break it down. In the beginning, Chrono Cross is a pastoral islander fantasy, radiating with warmth, nostalgia, whimsy, mystery, intrigue, interconnected characters, 
characters from many walks of life. It feels like it's building to something, which it is, but it explodes into something far weirder. I was expecting a series of travels and beautiful islands, you know, judging by the first quarter of the game, leading to a clash with a rival and an emotional but relatively low-key finish at a temple or something. I got space. Now I mentioned the mechanics of Cross were complex, and I can't say it's for the better, but it is engaging. Maybe it's the novelty. Firstly, you can run from almost any battle for free, and because enemies just wander aimlessly, you're free to engage at your leisure. Your characters have a stamina bar that fuels basic attacks, and even having only one stamina point is enough to finish with a spell, which are called elements in this game. Your basic attack comes in three varieties, weak, medium, strong, and each has a different percent chance to land. Battles typically unfold with the player using progressively stronger attacks to build up an additional power number. You spend the accumulated power on strong spells. It's simpler in practice than explanation, and only takes a few hours to really get the groove of. I like emitting strong attacks almost entirely for a better chance to build power, especially because medium attacks are pretty darn efficient after a weak hit or two. Worth mentioning to anyone seriously trying to play the game, there's a little element field grid at the top which indicates the color of the last three spells cast in battle. The more a color is present, the stronger, further same color spells will be. It's the ace most hard bosses have, so controlling the field color with throwaway spells is pretty common by endgame. You can collect summons to use if you've set the field to only one color, they're apparently really strong. Didn't need them. Didn't bother. And there are dual techs and even triple techs in the game, but almost none of them are worth the investment. Except X-Strike, you know, blowing that jellyfish to bits in one hit really cemented it. I'm just floored by it all. You know, what's the answer to success through simplicity? Right, superfluous complexity. Nailed it! Now half the RPG is collecting and customizing your spell layout, but it's fine to just use the autoplace button if you're lazy. Just make sure you're packing heals. What stood out most after the joy of battles kind of dimmed with time is that most party members suck, like really, really bad. Very few can even approach competing with the main character, Surge. And that's a whole can of worms. You don't even level up normally in this game. I really like what they did, actually, but it can screw you just the same. You get random stat ups, pretty unreal reliably in normal battles, and to level, instead collect stars by killing bosses that effectively level up your whole roster somewhat inconsistently. It's a decent system, especially when you're juggling a million people and can't choose who to level, but it means whoever you're not actively training won't get incidental level ups, and sometimes the variable stat boosts granted by stars makes an active party member obsolete. Granted, we're talking the difference between an extra attack or two, but it's enough to be annoying when it's laid out in numbers. I hinted at it, but we're gonna get into progressively stronger spoiler territory here. So I took Glenn, who Trigger fans will recognize as Frog, well, more like his namesake, but he talks about the same. That requires making the deliberate choice not to heal the girl of a sickness after a major plot event, and it's a scene worth some discussion alongside the major conceit of the game. Chrono Cross is not about time travel, jumping between ages or whatever. Instead, two parallel universes overlay each other, and you cross over from time to time to meet the plot's demands. If you ever thought about what your life might have been like had you made different choices, if some people entered your life while others left, and you wondered how things might have been different, all of those very real human experiences Chrono Cross is a great game to play. It's why I assume the game intended to keep things relatively low-key, because the vibe of the early section reeks of meaningful understatement. So there's Surge, the early game party member of three potential candidates he picked from, and Kid, who's sick and dying. You're gonna need a reagent from an extinct or otherwise legendary creature. What would you do? The good choice is obvious, be the hero, I'll get the ingredients, I'll come back, somehow we'll save her. But you're a small time island kid, you just got annihilated, knocked out of a tower by a man whose face is traumatic to you. And now you've got to do the impossible? Setting aside that choosing not to save her gets you a better party member, it's the realistic role-playing choice. Surge shouldn't be in any condition to do the impossible, and when an NPC chastises you for it, his mother defends the integrity of the role-playing. It's great. It's nothing to do with cowardice, just disillusionment with the adventure, understanding how insignificant you are early on. That got a lot of respect out of me. And there aren't a lot of other choices. For the rest of the journey, it's hard to know where to go, what to do. There's unmarked locations you can discover. The game's packed with obscure event flags. Progression is all over the place. But it salvages itself in the endless intrigue of finding new people to recruit, drooling over new locations. This game, oh my god. God! And to be fair, very little space is used for the events of the game. Everything's well within your reach. It's connecting the dots that's tough. But you become very intimate with the universe of Chrono Cross. 
At least you think you do. What's truly weird, and maybe the most meaningful, is Serge's place in the world. He's absolutely the most important character, not by virtue of what he does, but rather what the plot reveals about him in the end game. Arguably not great writing, but okay. Yet the lore surrounding the entirety of the game before the ending has almost nothing to do with him directly. The story events do, the lore hardly does. The active players on the world stage are the characters you meet, who all have one or more connections, or form some bond with another. Oftentimes whole groups of characters have shared history and dealings in the world. The characters external to Surge matter, they get the extra scenes, they get the discoverable bonus moves, they get to meet their other selves and converse across dimensions. Surge has almost no connections save for Kid, arguably Harley, and then loses himself utterly halfway through the game. It reminds me of Trigger in that moment, the pain of watching your most reliable party member, you, die. And most of the game after the halfway mark is, like Trigger, about getting the main character back. These searches for the hero are some of the most memorable moments of the games, even if these characters weren't all that important in the world prior to the adventure. People have gathered around them and are willing to fight for their friend. It's something. And this is the spoiler section in case you've got the grapes to emulate this thing. It gets wild. Here it goes. Lynx the Demi-Human is the guy you chase all around the aisles to beat down until you meet him on top of a tower. A tower that the game opened with, showing you a deadly premonition, pun intended, of Surge stabbing Kid. And you relive that intro sequence. Lynx swaps bodies with Surge, leaving you stranded between dimensions without any allies. And when this happened, I didn't want to play anymore. I fought hard with my party. Why would I have to give them up? Because the game's throwing its own story away. But that is the story. Surge was nobody, and he becomes somebody through his actions, creating his legend, inspiring and acquiring new allies in a bid to find his old body, reverse the spell, and save the world. By the time I got my old party back, I didn't even care. But we always take Glenn back, can't ignore the DPS. I think Chrono Cross is a mountain to climb, it's a struggle, and I imagine many of its quirks and challenges pull enough players out too early to reach the payoff, but it's sweet to look back on. The problem, and why it'll never live up to Trigger, is its handling of the story. Sleek, smooth, sensical. Trigger works from start to end, period. It can dare to be strange and funny because it fits the world. Chrono Cross abandons its quaint paradise without prompt or warning for a land of machines and technology, holograms, projections, time-frozen false epochs guarded by some guy named Miguel with a giant holy light sword. Why is this the hardest boss? It's a guy? Hey, unnecessary lore dump incoming. Seriously, the end game is half text boxes. Turns out, mankind has such a great set of islands because they were terraformed by the great super species of humans whose descendants now populate the Earth, and the world's been guided by a program called Fate who is actually Lynx, who is actually Robo, kind of, who is actually Fate, who needed Surge's body because his DNA unlocks the door to control the world again because Surge is negating Fate's influence by simply existing because Surge shouldn't exist in the first place because he was dumped from his dimension to the other, something about his dad who is actually Lynx, who is actually Fate? This isn't half as fun as I thought it would be. The real kicker is that the Woo! dinosaurs from Chrono Trigger are coming to destroy the world. So this alien says you can't fit in his UFO, even though you're all clearly standing in it. So instead produces this miniature UFO that he attaches to your boat so you can hover up to the flying dino fortress. And it ties into Trigger. Chrono, Luca, Marl... Lee even all show up multiple times and give lengthy text dumps about all of this total crap. This completely unnecessary crap. I'm serious, Cross is a really cool game, and even its story and lore that I find superfluous, to the point of offense, has loads of cool ideas, but it's always going to look bad when you lead the player somewhere, really flesh something out, make the player fall in love with the setting, and say, yeah, actually, you don't know anything. Here's a textbook on how the space-time continuum works and free will is suddenly a major theme and none of you have it. And that's why Surge could make a choice about Kid early on. He was immune to fate's manipulation the whole time. My god. But why can party members make choices? Fascinating story. Like watching a car crash. Not how to go about telling it, though. Absolutely do not save a novella of unknowable secret knowledge until the end. And above all of that absolute nonsense, 
The combat dies where Diminish thrives. There's a spell called Diminish that reduces elemental damage, so you drop it and bully everything into the dirt with the power of raw physical attacks. Yes, I'm using Surge's best weapon, and double Einlanders, but it holds true across most setups. Strategic combat is eventually obsoleted, and even worse so with the final set of bosses that hardly challenge the player in meaningful ways. It's a shame, a nice victory lap, but hardly the epic conclusion that Lavos was the first time, or most JRPG bosses are for that matter. It's the damnedest thing about Chrono Cross. I meant it when I said I know I'd enjoy Trigger more on a repeat playthrough, but there's something vibing from Cross, that magical island setting untouched by plot lunacy, the thrill of crossing dimensions. There's hope for a better game. There's something worth revisiting that worms its way into your heart. And if you just keep sailing, you'll find it. One day. So this wonderful woman sailed me home, joined my party, and just swims back home. What is this game, bro? Hey, it's K-Bash. Special thanks goes out to my $4 patrons, whose names are on the screen. The show's on its way somewhere good, thanks to the community's generosity. And special thanks goes out to my extra generous patrons, who are... 1307, Andy Blarg, Azero, Basement Dweller, Beverage Crisp, Boha, Brandon, Brios, Cal, Caesar T, Chief, Cordant, Chris A, Cody Golden, Corgi the Lad, Couch Moba, CW Glassworks, Kyle Lapreed, Daddy Dagoth, Dakota Storm Jones, Dara, David Castillo, Demon, Den Het, Don't Worry About It, Dylan Coffee, Annex, Exa, Frankenstitch, Glyph Seeker, Guard Corey, Gucci Plant, Hatsune Miku's Crack House, Harkaj, Heman Gaming Station, Huey, Ingenious Clown, Ice Kyle, Jason Lasky, Jaden, Jay Deus, John Weber, Joke Frog, Justin Sherry, Keegan Too Cool, Keith Myers, Kelvin, Creighton, Crazy Dark Chocolate, Latrix, Laundry Mom, Lego Sid, Liam, Lawn, Lucas Phoenix, Magical Madman, Markules, Marmato, Maximilian Wolfgang Niver, Milky Moo Official, Michelanius, Mr. Dodongo, Miles Burris, Nito Torpedo, Old Burgle, Old Man Cranberry, Only LK, Pink Peacock, Quasar McDougal, Quillworth, Quinn, Reggie Rodriguez, Ricochet Frame, Sagit Trash, Siren Smells Good, Salty Smasher, Sekai Noah Warida, Seamus Nerd, Shod, Simp God, Slagathor, Special Children, Spooky Grimalkin, Sublime Cataclysm, Super Sandwich Guy, Tenken Zephyrborn, TFY Lex, The Big Bubby, The Salt Knight, They Call Me Gambit, Thrips Heartrop, Travis Edwards, Twiddle Chungus, V01156, Venom, Viewers Like You, Vic, Walter Taggart, Waposa, Weeb Trash, Well Shit, Yay Kundo, Zachary V, Zanasso, Zane the Impure, Zane the Pure, Zed Slayer Gamer, if you'd like to help support the show and make it even better, check out my Patreon. We've got all kinds of goals and lots of rewards in store. Stay tuned for more. K-Bash out.